Okay. So I want to tell you about I want to tell you about all this stuff. Um, and uh, here we go. Reality check. The fork happened. It was painful. It was painful for all of us. We lived through the confused narratives, the changing, the moving goalposts. They moved more than the ball did. The ball was kind of stationary. <laughs> And uh, the constant fighting, the bickering, the trolls and everything, it's over. Okay, so it's now time to look forward. And, um, and so we have two different visions for how this currency, is, or how the, the original currency could play out. One of them is a store of value. Uh, proposition, and they've been pushing that, 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 pro, uh, that vision pretty hard, and they've been celebrating with champagne or whatever that thing is, um, the, uh, the idea of high fees. And let them do that. Let them, let them drink their champagne, and uh, let's focus on the, the world ahead. And that world starts with increased adoption. And on this front, you all have been doing a fantastic job. Okay, so the number of good news in terms of adoption that's coming in is, is incredibly good to hear. And with adoption comes greater scale, the need for greater and greater scale. So how are we going to get that scale? Can we possibly tweak the block size forever? That's a good question. And, uh, and indeed, so let's actually sort of make sure that we've established the baseline. Increasing the block size was exactly the right first move. Okay, so we have extensive uh, measurement studies on this. My group was the first study of uh, actual resources uh, that uh, Bitcoin nodes actually possess. And uh, we've done longitudinal studies uh, spanning multiple years on how much these, uh, these resources, the network bandwidth and so forth, have been increasing. So I can tell you from a position of scientific measurement that it was indeed possible to, to increase the block size without any threat to centralization as, as the Bitcoin Cash community did. And in fact, continuing to tweak the, the block size is going to be important because we don't live in a static world. We have more and more bandwidth available, and as we do, we can increase the block size. But will, is that going to be enough? And here, I'm here to tell you maybe something that you might not be so prepared to hear, but it is true regardless. Greg Maxwell and friends are not entirely wrong. Okay? You can't tweak the block size completely to you can't continually tweak the block size over and over again and, uh, and scale by just simply upping that one single parameter. Uh, demanding use cases like microtransactions, Internet of Things, and so forth require a level of scale that you just can't get with bigger and bigger and bigger blocks. Not only that, but now that we have a, a, a sort of a vibrant community, we have to lead intellectually. It is not sufficient to sort of take the code that's developed elsewhere and incorporate here. And it's very dangerous to be in a position where you are on an island someplace and there's another island somewhere else, and these people are living under a perhaps kind of insane, perhaps self-imposed resource restriction, and developing a whole bunch of resourceful protocols as a result, they can just come over to your island and suddenly bring you, you know, all sorts of things uh, that, uh, that, that you, you, you might not be prepared for. You need to be on the lead here. So it's essential that we understand uh, how to scale up further from here. And what I'm going to do in this talk is talk a little bit about options for scale both on-chain and both also off-chain because uh, the, my main point there is going to be you've been indoctrinated with the Lightning Network, but there are other options available. And there's a coherent vision for off-chain scaling that fits into the Bitcoin Cash world. And I'll talk, if there's time available, about scaling in the network. The often underlooked uh, sort of uh, orphan child of this whole stack is the network stack. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about Bitcoin NG. NG is uh, short for next generation. This is work from a long time ago now, maybe four years ago that we did when this whole thing was just starting. Uh, we decided, me and, uh, and Itai Eyal and uh, um, uh, Robert Van Ness and, um, and another student, uh, Efe Genjar, uh, to, to see how one might scale up Bitcoin without changing any of the, the core vision parameters, if you will. That is, retain the miners, retain almost everything there is to retain about the system when it comes to security, when it comes to assumptions of trust, and yet allow a couple of orders of magnitude. By a couple, I just mean one or two. Uh, unfortunately, this is not going to get us all the way to a million. This is just one uh, piece of this like, three-pronged puzzle. So I will tell you a little bit about Bitcoin NG, but I would really very much encourage you to read the paper, to take a look at it, because this is sort of a roadmap for how I believe 
a proper scientific inquiry about scaling ought to happen. The paper does three things. It proposes a protocol, and you've all seen protocols proposed. Yeah, everyone's seen those terrible white papers. You know, A sends a message to B, B sends, you know, those sort of descriptive things about how you could do things. But in addition to doing that protocol description, it also introduces metrics, quantitative measures for how we can achieve, how we can measure whether or not we're achieving our goals. And then it actually develops a full simulation framework for running the entire Bitcoin network in a data center and simulating it all. And then it actually looks at the result. I want to give you a sort of a sense for what we did, so just so that we sort of understand how not to fall into that pitfall where you've got sort of developers making up stuff and doing design by gut. Okay, so they're, you know, we all know how that actually played out. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Bitcoin NG. The core, core thing here, the core insight, is to notice that in Bitcoin, blocks serve two purposes. Okay, so here's a block, and there's one component of this block uh, that is the crypto puzzle. And what it really does, if you, if you sort of put on the right glasses, is that the crypto puzzle gives the right to a miner to dictate what happened in the last 10 minutes. Okay? It's sort of like a leader election. By solving the crypto puzzle, you become the leader for the preceding 10 minutes. And you get to then serialize what happened in those 10 minutes. You get to add to the end of this distributed ledger. Once you see things this way, once you realize that this is a retrospective protocol where we elect a leader who then determines what happened in the past, we can then make a very small change. And that very small change takes us to an interesting, interesting location. Now, what would we like to do? We'd love to be able to expand the block size. We'd love to have huge blocks. But if we do that, then we start getting forks. We start leaving the smaller miners behind. Or we might want to have huge frequency of blocks. But again, if we do that, we leave small miners behind. Again, that's uh, going, to, going to cause centralization. What I would love to do is to be at the intersection of these things. I would love to have low latency and high throughput, but without a fear of forks. And if I go back to this picture, when this stuff is happening, when regular Bitcoin transactions are happening, what we really have is a network that's mostly quiescent. There's almost nothing happening except, you know, Joe pays, you know, Jane and so forth. Just transactions are being floated around. Then suddenly a block is found and everybody goes into a frenetic activity. They try to disseminate this block as fast as possible. And then, you know, it goes back to a quiescent state again. It would be wonderful if we did not have such frenetic periods, because those periods are really the stressful times. So how do we do this? Well, I'd like to have, you know, as I said, high throughput, low latency, secure protocol. So here is how Bitcoin NG proposes to do this. It says, take your blocks, split them into two that serve two different purposes. We're going to have something that we call a key block. And uh, that key block is going to serve the purpose of selecting a leader, if you will. And, uh, and a number of micro blocks, and the micro blocks will serialize what's, what's happening as it happens in real time. And instead of a retrospective protocol that serializes what happened in the last 10 minutes, we're going to have a forward-looking protocol that selects someone, and, and that someone then says, okay, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. So how does that look? Well, okay, it looks like this. Inside every key block, key blocks are going to be found with proof of work using the same old miners we always had. Inside the Coinbase, there is going to be a key, just like there is a key today. Okay? There is going to be no other identification of the miner. No IPs, no ports. Those are all immaterial and not at all on the blockchain, on the NG blockchain. But there is a key just like there is today. And that Coinbase key is then used to mint a series of small micro blocks that contain transactions as they happen. So the key things to notice here are that key blocks are very small and rare. They come every 10 minutes, just like before. Micro blocks are very, very small, but they're frequent. So instead of having a giant block every 10 minutes and, and you know, going into that frenetic mode, what we're going to do is we're going to smear the creation of that block across those 10 minutes and take away the centralization pressure from the system. So pictorially, how does this look? So here, let's, uh, let's imagine that we have a blockchain. Those, those two green things show us the, the tail of the blockchain. And then a miner comes in, and they find a block, a key block, uh, that says, hey, I found a good crypto puzzle, and here's my key. And uh, from that point, there's no other content in that block. It's just their key. That accomplishes the leader election task. And from that point on, as transactions come in, 
that miner takes that transaction, signs it with the key in his Coinbase. So he then starts minting these micro blocks up there that I've shown two of that, uh, that continually extend the, um, the blockchain. Those blocks are threaded together in the, uh, in the typical blockchain manner. Okay, so you can't just take one out without breaking the entire chain. So, uh, so that, of course, gives us this ever-expanding chain. And at some point, some other miner, in this case the yellow miner, might come in and find a key block of his own. And he will hook in you know, to this, this ever-expanding chain at whatever point that, uh, that he hooks in at. Okay? And that might actually cut off a couple of the micro blocks, and that's OK. So, uh, so the, uh, the interval between these key blocks, as I mentioned, is still 10 minutes. Uh, so the centralization pressure is completely off, um, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the frenetic activity is reduced immensely. The block sizes here are now tiny, and they're actually distributed across a, a, a bunch of time. Now, those of you who are technical in the, in the audience would say, hey, that sounds uh, nice, but there are all sorts of attacks you could imagine. Yes, indeed, there are all sorts of attacks. They come down to two, uh, two formats, if you will. One is the leader could hide microblocks, or you could ignore micro, micro blocks. That is, if you are the red fellow here, you could, you could hook in not at the tail end, but earlier, and try to steal some micro blocks for yourself. Uh, or if you're the blue guy, then you create a long chain, but you don't give it to someone, you squat on it, uh, hoping that you'll be the red guy and, and sort of extend your own chain longest uh, yourself. Those are both re reasonable attacks. And, uh, and in fact, that's where the, the discussion gets a bit complicated. I'm not going to go into this uh, too much, except to say the reward structure is a little different. Okay, so to game theoretically uh, incentivize people the right way, here in this universe, uh, what, we, what we do is uh, we set up a slightly different game where the miners are compensated both for the work they did and also for the work that they extended. Okay? So we're trying to make sure that everybody works most for the public good. And so that red fellow is not only going to get some money for the red microblocks he mints, but he also gets some reward for the blue microblocks that he extends. So that particular setup will require some kind of math, and I'm not going to go into it, except sort of to flash it at you and say, OK, well, so if you read the paper, uh, you will see that there are some constraints on, on what that payoff ought to be. And it turns out that if you actually compensate somebody 40% for their own blocks and 60% for the blocks they extend, uh, it, lead, it leads to sort of a virtuous cycle where everybody has the right incentives to work together and extend the longest chain. So, um, so that's the core idea. I'm very happy to take more questions about this uh, after the talk, if you will. But, uh, but then now, what, what next? And the reason why I came here is probably to try to sort of talk to you about how to really do this. Okay, so at this point, one could start emailing and, and start hiring troll armies or a small army of people who fix the narrative or whatever the proper terminology is. But the real right thing to do at this point is to actually come up with some metrics. And I, I was shocked when after three years of this block size debate, nobody actually did this. So um, what we did was, okay, well, we're going to propose a new protocol. We should know how to measure this. This is, this is the only way to do science. So we came up with, uh, with about five metrics, uh, mining power utilization, fairness, consensus delay, time to win and time to prune. Uh, I'll talk about some of them later on. Um, but you need metrics if you're going to be doing this. And the second thing is you need an apparatus for measuring and evaluating protocols. We then went into the lab and we measured everything there is to measure for every single public Bitcoin node. Okay, and we've been doing this for years now. So our goal was to create a miniature world, a replica of the Bitcoin network inside our own basement. So for every node out there, I want to have a node in the basement configured with the exact latency and bandwidth characteristics between that node and every other node. Okay? So that's, that's uh, the miniature world idea. So uh, um, let me show, sort of show you some of these metrics. Mining power utilization is very simple. It's the amount of, of, uh, of hash power that went into the chain. And if you look at this uh, for Bitcoin, it's in the 99%. If you look at it for Ethereum, it's actually, uh, by design, it's lower. 
Um, it's an interesting metric, it's a simple one. The time to win and time to prune are the complicated ones. Fairness is an interesting one. You wanna make sure that the people who experience orphans experience them in regard to their hash power. You don't want the small people, small miners experiencing more orphans uh, because if, if that's what you have, then the small miners will tend to coalesce and that will give you centralization pressure. So, uh, and there are a bunch of other metrics as well. Um, so we built this uh, miniature world thing. It's actually very difficult to figure out the network conditions uh, between nodes, but we, we did our best to do that. And uh, we created a one to six replica for the purposes of uh, this paper back in 2014. Uh, one to six replica of the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin network. So um, let's see. Um, and then we took realistic data from the hash power distribution. So here are some interesting graphs. I think I'll flash only one at you. Um, on purpose, back then, we did not want to take a side in the Bitcoin, si uh, Bitcoin block size debate. So we, uh, we changed the x-axis quite a bit uh, so that it wouldn't be directly comparable to, uh, to any of the sizes that you know. So here, we, we essentially changed a couple of parameters so that uh, we could see interesting effects, uh, but they're not going to correspond directly to sizes that you know because the frequency has been changed. And we also don't have, you know, we can't wait 10 minutes with nothing happening in between key blocks. We don't have that much life to live uh, uh, if, if we did it that way. We had to speed everything up. So uh, just to give you a sense though, the entire block size debate is being, was, was being waged on what would be considered the left-hand side of this, this graph. So going from one, one megabyte to eight megabytes is essentially always uh, somewhere over here. So the, so the big fight was around from around here to around over here. You can see the error bars. So people are getting really worked up over, over that, over essentially noise, okay? So you could have gone to the right and there would have been no change in fairness uh, uh, at all. And so that entire narrative just quantitatively did not make sense. Uh, we tried to sort of bring this up with the, the core devs and so forth, but of course uh, they have a bunch of mechanisms for uh, for shutting down any, any scientific discussion. So, um, <laughs> no, I didn't mean to, I don't, maybe that was too harsh. I mean, they're individually great people, uh, but, but the forums did not lend themselves to a scientific discussion. So, um, let's see. Um, so you can see the, the interesting thing here. They are not wrong. So as you make the block size bigger and bigger, Bitcoin does decay. Its performance drops, in fact, immensely. And you can see, of course, that Bitcoin NG does not. And it should not be surprising because it's by design still issuing one block every 10 minutes and uh, is not going to suffer from, from the same problems as, uh, as regular legacy systems. So I have a bunch of other graphs. I'm going to skip this stuff. Um, so uh, what's the sort of takeaway from this portion of the talk? Reparameterization can only take us so far. And, uh, uh, so maybe Bitcoin NG can give us, in the medium term, a way to scale up if, if reparameterization runs into trouble, okay? So I'm not here to push Bitcoin NG. You know, you guys can take it or not, but at least you should know that it's there, okay? And it's good to know that there is actually a path out in the future. So, um, uh, but how much can it actually help? It gives us about 100 transactions per second or thereabouts. And that's good, okay? I mean, it, give, it gave us 100 transactions per second uh, back, the, back then, right, so, or thereabouts. Um, it's, it's good, but it's not quite Google scale. It's not going to be IoT scale. So what should we do? Can we do better than this? And I want to talk to you a little bit about going off chain, okay? So you've all been indoctrinated. You've been sold the idea that the only layer two solution is the Lightning Network, and I, I, I will grant to you I will grant to you that it's got the coolest name, okay? It's got a cooler name than what I'm about to show you. But it's a false narrative, okay? It wasn't the first layer two solution, and it's not the best layer two solution. There are other alternatives that every community should, should explore, and I, I'll talk about one of them. So let me tell you a little bit about the lightning layer problems. Oof. Um, I'm not sure if I have enough time to do this, but... Uh, I'm not gonna be able to fix all of them. Some are inherent to layer two, okay? So I have a slightly different vision for layer two than what you hear from core. Uh, but let me actually, oh, all the hands are going up. Yeah, okay. Um, so I've been hoping to have some time to write a blog post about this. Well, the first and biggest problem is it has limited capacity. The capacity of that network is unknown. Despite so many years of noise around it, nobody has actually gone and done a scientific study. And that actual emergent capacity is going to depend on the credit relationships between people. And we don't know what that's going to be like. 
And it's not that, that that credit graph is going to look nothing like the Facebook social graph. The fact that I know and love Tariq does not mean that I'm going to extend to him you know, $100,000 worth of credit. It's just sorry, but it's not going to happen. So that network may or may not actually have any carrying capacity. And um, it's economically broken. Um, so how is it broken? There is no benefit unless the endpoints have frequent interactions. So Tariq and I end up interacting once a year. That is not enough of a reason to open up a channel between us, even if he were credit worthy for 100,000. And worse, an exchange needs to have funds on hand tied into channels that are proportional to the float for per person times the number of people that they want to support. So uh, suppose somebody could receive up to $10,000 from Coinbase, and Coinbase has, I don't know, 10 million users, so 10 million times 10,000, uh, 10 billion, 100 billion dollars gets tied up, is that right? I don't know, I, that was, so you know, in that, that future world where they wanna do that, if LN really takes off, a lot of coins are going to be all, tied into these payment channels. The system is insecure, requires new intermediaries, you know, so you all know about the malleability fix, the kitchen sink known as Segwit, Segwit um, that if I were to propose it, I'm sure it would not have been accepted, and yet somehow, uh, somehow it got into Bitcoin Core. So, um, so it requires keys to be kept online. You need this new thing called watch guards to watch the chain 24 seven or else you lose funds. You blink, you lose, right? I close the channel with an old state and you lose your money. And counterparty misbehavior can lock up funds. Some bad thing happens and now we have to wait for timeouts. So um, uh, let's see, it erodes privacy. Um, I don't know, so yeah, oh yeah, this is important, I should mention this. Uh, routing involves an inherent trade-off between finding out what paths are available in the network, and uh, that is uh, an inherent trade-off between efficiency and privacy. So to find a good money route to you, I need to know about everybody's credit relationships, and I need to be able to do this in real time as it changes. And if I were to do that, then I'm actually monitoring you. Right? I find out that that gentleman over there has a credit relationship with the, the, the person behind him. Well, I do it over and over again, and suddenly if the capacity changes, I know that somebody paid someone else over that link. And that, is, is, that gives me the ability to do what we call network tomography. And that is not at all a good outcome. Uh, routing is difficult except for hub and spoke models, uh, and you know, it's the user experience is overall a mess. So will I be able to fix all of this? No, I, sadly, it requires much more research to fix all of them. Uh, but I will tell you about how to fix some of them. In particular, um, uh, the capacity of the network I can't fix. But we can fix the economic model, and we can fix the, uh, the insecurity, the malleability fix, the requirement for malleability fix. So I, I will, let me present to you one way of doing layer two that works on Bitcoin Cash today without SegWit, without any malleability fixes. And the core uh, sort of foundation for this is a new capability that new chips have. Many new chips from Intel, ARM, uh, AMD, and Ledger, and so forth, have a secure element capable of doing three things. This element can run some code with confidentiality without revealing what it is, do what that code is doing internally, with integrity, without allowing you to attach a debugger and change what the code is doing, or allowing the code to be manipulated in any other shape or form, even if you are attached to the bus, even if your unepoxied USB port has some foreign device, even then you cannot molest what that code is doing. And then the third thing that you get out of these, uh, these new chips is attestation, and this is the critical part. I can ask a question to Omari, let's say, and say, what hash are you running right now? And he has to give me, or his chip, will give me a fingerprint of the code he's running so I know exactly what behaviors he can engage in and I also know what behaviors he won't engage in. And this is the cr critical insight. So instead of a Byzantine world, these chips carry us to a fail-stop world. So the worst you can do is stop execution, but you can't willy-nilly misbehave. So um, yeah, I mentioned this, you only need to trust the code that's running inside the chip, and it has this fingerprint thing. That's, so Alice can ask Bob, what, what's your hash? And he says something like, it's uh, dead beef and you know exactly what Bob is going to do, Bob himself cannot molest his chip uh, to execute something other than the dead beef code after that attestation. So uh, let's see, the key thing with T-Chan is that both parties exchange their secret keys and become capable of closing the channel on their own without cooperation from the other side. And uh, 
So there is a typical, very similar to Lightning, there is a setup event where uh, one of the parties talks to the blockchain, but subsequent to the setup, they no longer have to communicate with the blockchain. Alice can pay Bob without monitoring the blockchain at all. Okay, this is crucial. So it's kind of like an open dime device. So you and I can go off, off, off the network, we're in the middle of the Sahara, and we exchange, exchange cash securely without ever, ever touching the blockchain itself at all. And when we go back, we then, one of us will close the channel, and we can't close the channel with a stale state. Why not? Because this is a hardware solution. If it were software, I wouldn't know what you're doing. You would have access to all previous states. So if you read the lightning paper about, it's what, 60 something pages, and 59 of those pages are all about what do you do about the stale state? What do I do when the counterparty uses an old state that's advantageous to him to close the channel? That cannot happen here. I know that he discarded the old states because I know what Cody was running because it was running on the secure hardware and I knew the hash of it. So um, uh, we implemented this and uh, we're seeing enormous, enormous uh, uh, throughput per channel. It's um, on my dinky laptop. I was getting 78,000 transactions per second uh, when sending money from uh, London to Ithaca. And uh, the delay, the, the latency of a transaction in this universe is uh, 0 0.4 milliseconds plus network transfer. So in this case, about 40 milliseconds to cross the Atlantic and then a fraction of a millisecond to actually make the, the payment. So uh, if you have multiple channels, the throughput scales linearly, and as I said, it doesn't require a malleability fix. We just don't care about, about misbehaviors involving malleability. Um, so now you can say, well, aren't you trusting Intel here, or aren't you trusting somebody? Yes, yes, we are, absolutely. That's the trade-off we're making. So um, uh, that, that is true, uh, but I would like to point out that you also are trusting Intel. Last time I checked, all of you just issued a transaction without manually checking the computations, right? So nobody has a little abacus where they redid the, the modular exponentiation. It's a little tough to do. So, uh, so you are already trusting that hardware base anyway, um, but it's also important to notice that the trust is channel bound. So if Intel decides to misbehave, they cannot affect the system. They can perhaps manipulate and, and allow my counterparty to steal the funds I have in the channel with my counterparty. That is the max. So if I have $1,000 open to you and you're in cahoots with Intel, you could steal my, my $1,000. And um, Intel makes about $58 billion a year. Whether or not they would do that with you uh, seems, uh, seems kind of nonsensical to me. Um, and, uh, but much more importantly, uh, we're not beholden to just Intel. There are many other vendors, and, uh, and one could, uh, uh, could actually c conceive of other ways of doing this so that you, you don't trust any single vendor alone. Um, so overall, if you were to compare T-Chan to Lightning Network, it's more secure, except it's, it's, it's more secure because the keys are not online in software. Um, they are in hardware itself, so it it's hardens the implementation. Uh, counterparty misbehavior does not lock up funds. The T-Chan uh, approach requires no change to the underlying blockchain, no SegWit. It doesn't require a change to the ecosystem. We don't need watch guards. We don't need banks. That's the whole reason why we are here, right? To, to be our own banks. So you don't, you don't have to be beholden to someone who's connected to the, the blockchain 724 and monitors it for you. Uh, or you, don't, you are not beholden to a routing hub. It's economically efficient. I didn't mention this perhaps, but exchanges need to tie up only money that's proportional to their float, and uh, so that gives us a factor of n improvement. Okay, so instead of n times float, we just have the float. Um, so if Coinbase will spend at most uh, $10 million per day uh, paying out, that's the amount of funds they need to have in the channels. And uh, so what's the vision here? It is not my vision that we employ this to create connections between you and your Aunt Bertha, okay? That is not a workable model. That is the model that leads us down that UX user experience that's going to be absolutely terrible. But these kinds of solutions are crucial for frequently interacting businesses. This is the kind of thing you need when you have two businesses, like exchanges, that frequently communicate. It can give us great improvements in arbitrage and prices between exchanges. So this is, uh, that's I think my vision. That, uh, and in fact, that's the vision we're working towards, which is uh, not this deployment for users, although the users could actually just as equally participate in this model. Um, I think that's a, that's a bit of a pipe dream. 
uh, the, the sort of the, the more sensible approach is to actually co uh, connect this to exchanges. So, um, and of course, we do multi-hop transactions and so on and so forth, but these are all kind of, if you ask me as an academic, I will say these multi-hop transactions are an academic idea. They're very cute, very, very cool. We worked really hard to make sure they're atomic so your money doesn't get paid, doesn't get stuck between your aunt Bertha and, and like the person she knows in Boston and so forth when it's getting routed. Um, so either payments happen at, uh, fully or they don't happen at all. Um, so that's a very nice thing to have, um, but, uh, but uh, I don't think that, uh, I just don't think that that's where this, uh, this vision is going to take us. Uh, this, I don't think that layer two should be, should be deployed to the masses. It's just not ready. The routing will not be ready for another five to 10 years at, at best, uh, the routing protocols. So let me uh, just take one more uh, sort of segment and talk to you about another layer, the long forgotten, the long overlooked network layer, and tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing to speed up communication of financial data between people who have it and the people who want it. So if it's, it's users, exchanges have it, miners demand it, users have it, miners demand it, or vice versa, miners have it, and exchanges and users want, uh, want access to blocks. So um, what are the sort of the options here? Well, let me tell you a little bit about what happens today. In a peer-to-peer -peer system like Bitcoin, uh, we have a source, a relay, and a peer, um, and this is time going down in this case, and the source might have a block that they have discovered, and they want to transmit that block. That's the start time, that's the end time, and let's say that takes time beta. Relay gets it, relay checks the block, and uh, you know, it takes time alpha to check the block, then relay transmits it to the peer, and that takes another beta, and this poor guy receives the block at alpha plus two beta, okay? So if there are n hops, it's alpha plus n beta. So, uh, oh, oh, yeah, okay, so n, sorry, um, no, no, I apologize, it's not alpha plus n beta. The, it's n times alpha plus beta is the, is the full-on uh, transmission latency. So um, can, we do this, can we do this entire process better? And the answer is of course, and uh, this is something that we already did for the Falcon system, Falcon uh, relay network, that actually powers both Bitcoin Cash and uh, BTC. So um, let me tell you about what Falcon does. It does the following thing. Um, a source finds a block, uh, the relay receives it, he checks only the header to make sure that the source is not misbehaving, and then sends it on to recipients. So, uh, so indeed it takes uh, the, the, uh, um, the uh, the transmission of the block still takes time beta, and, um, uh, but the delays, the alphas, have been compressed, and uh, if you have n hops, then we have a big savings of n beta, n times beta. Remember that beta is the, the, the significant uh, time here, so we actually uh, took out a linear factor. We took out a whole n to speed up dissemination of financial data. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with new infrastructure that can be used to serve as the foundation of currencies. And Bitcoin Cash could use it, but many other currencies could use it as well. In fact, we're talking to various different projects that want to use it as sort of an Akamai for financial data. Whereas Akamai is uh, sort of destined or designed for sort of throughput of web information, this is for low latency. It's an overlay network for low latency with a bunch of nodes scattered around the globe uh, whose purpose is to send data from people who have it to people who demand it. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I'm gonna con conclude by pointing out that it's a super exciting time to be working on cryptocurrencies. Um, I showed you three, three projects. One is NG, it's available as a medium term solution for, uh, uh, for on-chain scaling. I talked to you about T-Chan, and I hope I sort of uh, tried to impart upon you the, the possibility that there are solutions other than the Lightning Network out there. And with the right sort of uh, culture, we can pursue them, and we can do better than what LN can do. It is not the end all of layer two. Um, third is, I think I tried to sort of uh, discuss with you, the idea that the network layer is, has been often overlooked and improvements there can, can actually uh, greatly improve the scale of cryptocurrencies. And if I leave you with one message, if I could leave you with one message, it would be this. Whatever we all do, we have to use scientific methods in discussing protocol changes. Thank you all. Woo! Yeah. All right. Uh,
Can we please welcome uh, that presentation with great Q&A questions? We only have about five minutes. Do we have any questions from the audience that reflects the quality of the presentation? Hi, I'm uh, Justin Bonds from uh, Cyber Capital. First of all, I want to say I have, a, I have a lot of respect for, for the work you've been doing, and we need more real scientists in the space, so I really love that. Um, my question was regarding uh, mining centralization. In the way that I see it, uh, miners generally don't run nodes. Pools run nodes. And because of the nature of variance and the way that the Bitcoin network works, there will only really be 10 to 30 pools. Mm -hmm. And I would argue these 10 to 30 pools can afford to run you know, very large full nodes. So yeah. um, I, I'll just, I'll just like your thoughts on that. that sure, my, um, I yeah. think you're right. Um, so how can I, I mean, what you, so what got said was um, the miner community um, will tend to center, will tend to sort of coalesce into dozens of, of players. And these players have the resources to have actually strong machinery. Um, I agree with this. And how could I not agree with this? Because we have eight years of history to look back upon, and that's what we see. Um, so indeed, that's, that's entirely true, and, um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think there was anything that I said in my presentation uh, that actually conflicts with what you said, as you're absolutely right. So, but can those pools afford to increase, let's say, block size to infinity? No. No, no I, I would just, if I could make one more quick question. Um, well, I would say, I think you have a point in that um, we can't scale to cover all use cases, and mm -hmm. I agree we need second layers for micro transactions and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. But I, but I would say that um, um, the cash use case, and also considering uh, that, that pools run full nodes, uh, you know, I, I see that as being quite viable uh, for being on chain. Oh, you, you agree? Absolutely, that's, I agree. That's my I question. agree. So, look, I'm not saying something like uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin NG should be deployed tomorrow. I, that's how I started. The very first thing was to improve, was to increase the block size. The next step, I think, I have a, I have a bullet point that said, next step should probably be to tweak it up as. Uh, technology permits us, and we should keep on doing that, um, but also I don't think we could tweak it up to infinity. So there will be a time, hopefully, in our lifetime that we will see when uh, these kinds of things start to bite us, and at least we should be able to sleep at night. I personally can't sleep well at night unless I know uh, that I'm covered you know, down the line. Um, so now I think I hope many of you can go, well, okay, if we actually hit that bottleneck, we know exactly what to do. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Final question. One more? Make it good, all right? Make it good. Great presentation. Um, so I was wondering, is there anything that can be learned from Ethereum and whether you've looked at any of the stuff that they're doing around sharding, for, ex for example? Yes, there's a lot to learn from Ethereum. So we, did a, we just published a paper last February at the Financial Cryptography Conference that looked at centralization, quantified centralization for Bitcoin pre-fork and Ethereum, and it was a longitudinal study spanning multiple years. Um, so there were some funny, funny results from there, um, and there are too many to, to do. That would be a separate presentation on its own. Um, but I'll give you one hint. Um, Ethereum actually has less resources. The average Ethereum node has less bandwidth available to it than Bitcoin nodes. And yet, Bitcoin actually, Ethereum processes more transactions per second than Bitcoin. So they're operating at a higher point in throughput with less resources. So it's quite possible. Um, another thing to notice, uh, um, I mean, there were like lots of interesting uh, uh, outcomes in that space. Uh, they, I mean, we could go on and on. They, they suffer from more orphans. Um, they have a slightly different protocol designed to compensate for that. Um, they definitely need something like what I alluded to at the network layer to try to reduce that. Um, and I can just go on like this for a long time, but the paper actually makes a, a cogent case of, of those two systems. But sharding specifically, have you looked oh, sharding. at sharding at all? Um, yeah, no, we are, we, we've thought about sharding quite a bit. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the things that is being actively worked upon by my group and by my colleagues at IC3. It would be great to see, I mean, I think the, the framework that you put with, with measurements and, and metrics uh, is incredible because that will make these different uh, approaches comparable side by side, and that's, that's the really exciting bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ming, okay. for awesome presentation, awesome questions. <laughs>